Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Independent National Dialogue on Youth Engagement in Sri Lanka's Food Systems. Uh, today, we are here to uh, discuss and uh, uh, go through the findings from the national and provincial level dialogues. Um, thank you for to our speakers joining us today, as well as to all of those um, joining us from all parts of Sri Lanka, especially to those who joined us for the provincial level discussions that uh, was conducted during the last few weeks. Uh, just wanted to go through a few logistical announcements before we get started with the agenda. Please do keep yourselves muted at all times. Your video can be turned on if your connection is good enough. Um, however, please do keep yourselves muted when if you have an active speaker. Uh, we want to uh, keep this discussion as engaging as possible. We have a, a section for an open discussion a little later during this session. So please drop any questions that you have on the chat and we could take it up then. Uh, this session is being recorded as well as being live streamed on Facebook. So hello to everyone also joining us from Facebook. And uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to my executive director, Ms. Vasita Vijayanayaka for the welcome and introduction. Vasita, over to you. Um, good morning. Thank you, Sanasia. Um, I would like to warmly welcome our distinguished guests. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Garmini Samanasinghe, the additional secretary at the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Ms. Dakshini Pereira, Assistant Director of the Climate Change Secretariat, Mr. Bimalain Sharan, who is the country representative for Sri Lanka and Maldives for FAO, uh, Dr. Dharma Sri Vijayaratna, who is Assistant FAO representative, uh, and all the other distinguished guests who are joining us. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to this dialogue that we are hosting today, which has the main objective of sharing the findings of the youth dialogues that we had um, in the last month. So we had close to 12 dialogues that were held at national and also provincial levels. And um, the objective of this is that we would feed these inputs into the national dialogue, the member state dialogue that happened and the submission that was made for Sri Lanka. And also the findings are shared with other um, stakeholders who work with us uh, during the um, UN Food System Summit Independent Dialogues. So um, for those who are not very familiar with Slack and Trust, Slack and Trust is a nonprofit think tank. We're based in Sri Lanka and we work uh, at national as well as international level. Um, so the work areas that we work in are climate change, sustainable development, uh, ecosystem and biodiversity conservation, social justice and animal welfare. And we work in, uh, at regional level in Asia, Africa and Europe at the moment on our work related to these topics in research and policy analysis. And we also have actions that we implement on the ground in Sri Lanka, which relate to uh, mangrove conservation, youth engagement, stakeholder engagement, as well as looking at how the policies and uh, laws could be driving towards sustainable development. Um, focusing on what we're doing today, we had uh, close to 30 dialogues in the last year, um, which focused on the UN Food System Summit, as well as issues related to food systems. And this has a component on the five action tracks under the UN Food Systems. And uh, since we work a lot on climate change, we had resilience and risk management as one of the key areas that we focused on. And these dialogues were not necessarily uh, national, uh, but they were also local level because we engaged with youth in person at provincial levels, as well as civil society organizations and other stakeholders working at local as well as national level. And we also had thematic dialogues that were targeting an international uh, engagement. So the risk management aspect, the just transition aspect, livelihoods, uh, nature-based solutions. And these were with different partners. Um, there'll be also a newsletter coming out, a special issue, which highlights all the work that we've been doing in the lead up to the uh, Food Summit, the pre-summit dialogue we had uh, as part of the UN Food System Summit, as well as the thematic work that we do with the UNFCCC and other actors uh, who are engaged in these dialogues. So uh, I won't take a lot of time because there are speakers from our organization as well as others who will be highlighting all these aspects in the speaker slots. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us and I warmly welcome all of you again and we hope for a very active dialogue going forward. Thank you, Sena, share with you. Thank you very much, Vasita. And um, good morning once again to all those who are just joining us. We have a registration form for the day um, that I will, that it would be great if you could fill it out just to get an idea of who is in the room with us, as well as to share the recording and any other uh, reports from this session. So I would like to move on to the first speaker uh, on our agenda, Dr. Garmini Samarasinghe. He's the additional secretary of technology at the Ministry of Agriculture. Dr. Samarasinghe. Yeah. 
uh, I think you can hear me now. Uh, yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ms. Oshita Vijayanayak, Executive Director, Mr. Vimalendra Sharan, FO Representative for Sri Lanka and Maldives, Ms. Dakshini Pera, uh, Climate Change Secretary, and Dr. Vijay Ratna, Assistant FO Representative and Representative of Global uh, Youth Forum for, on Climate Change. So, uh, and uh, let me thank you, especially the Executive Director, uh, Slick and Trust for this opportunity. Actually, I, I, as I understand, this uh, session is on uh, presenting the uh, report developed by the Slick, Slick and Trust on feedback given by the youth in nine provinces. Uh, as far as I know, more than 400 youth have been participated in this exercise. Uh, and uh, you may aware that uh, Ministry and uh, Food and Agriculture Organization uh, spent a lot of time on last few weeks to developing uh, the national pathway for the food system dialogue. <clears throat> so, uh, so we have uh, been guided by the Honorable Minister and the Secretary as well. So, uh, at the end of the exercises, we brought up the vision of Sri Lanka for sustainable food systems uh, and uh, for the pathways for development uh, towards the 2030 agenda. So if I uh, just mention uh, the, the three aspirational pathways developed were integrating nature positive production to make food systems sustainable and resilient, Poverty reduction through development of market oriented inclusive agri food value chains, achieving food and nutrition security and quality through sustainable food systems. So, there are a lot of uh, uh, focus areas uh, related to that have been uh, listed uh, along with the document. So, I, I believe this document uh, came up nicely, and thanks for, the, for who, those who worked. Uh, for the document and uh, participate in the di dialogues uh, during the course of the discussions. And uh, now here, the youth participation. As all we understand, uh, if you are marching towards the 2020 agenda, youth pa participation is a must. Now, let me give some examples that ministry has already started. Uh, now we have this uh, separate program for Youth Entrepreneur Program, which is funded by the national budget. And also we have this uh, mechanization because uh, we have to attract the youth. So mechanization, one of the key areas to be looked into. Uh, the Now using this uh, Climate Smart Irrigated Agriculture Project, they're going to develop machinery hubs in 47 agro, uh, agriculture uh, agrarian services centers. So that will definitely attract the youth for the uh, uh, when the machines are coming in, they will definitely like to work in the agriculture. In addition to that, there's a project called uh, Agriculture Modernization Project. There are a lot of production clusters and value chains have are being developed using that one. So that will also definitely attract the youth. In addition to that, as you know, this uh, agriculture very risky uh, business. Therefore, agriculture insurance, uh, agriculture, agrarian and agriculture insurance board is uh, working on working on uh, the, uh, the, the the working on the uh, loan schemes and also agriculture loan schemes and the farmers pension schemes. Uh, so that will actually definitely help uh, uh, support for the youth attraction. And also, uh, if you look at the food summit uh, document, there are a lot of activities listed. So they definitely they will we need the involvement of youth in the uh, agriculture. So in this context, the work done by Sri Can Trust is well appreciated. And I believe that will be very helpful to strengthen the food system summit output. So with this, I conclude which is a successful dialogue today. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you once again.
Thank you very much, Dr. Samar Singha. Uh, before we move on to our next speaker, I would like to kindly remind everybody to uh, do fill in the registration form that's all provided in the link. If you do have ac uh, trouble accessing the form, let us know and we'll be happy to help you out. Um, so with that, I would like to move on to Mr. Vimblain Rasharan. He's the FAO country representative uh, for Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Mr. Sharam brings with him nearly three decades of national and international government leadership experience focusing on rural development, agriculture, and food security issues. He's a member of the Indian Administrative Society Service, sorry, and he has worked with the Indian government extensively in rural and tribal areas of Maharashtra and has also been actively involved in agriculture and food policy formulation, working with the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare in New Delhi. Um, he comes to Colombo from his previous posting as director of FAO North America office, before which he was permanent representative of India to the Rome-based UN agencies, where he served as vice president of the World Food Program, executive board chairman of the evaluation committee at the International Fund for Agriculture Development, and as a member of the FAO program committee and council. Um, Dr. Sharan, uh, sorry, Mr. Sharan, over to you. Thank you, Sinashya. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> that, thank you for this uh, extensive introduction. I don't know if I deserve even half of what you said. Uh, let, me, let me start uh, today by thanking the uh, Slyken Trust for inviting me and giving me an opportunity uh, to be talking to all of you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and it's an honor to share my, my thoughts. Unless I forget, now let me also congratulate you for having organized these uh, 12 dialogues at the provincial level involving youth. Because what these dialogues have done is they have given a platform to youth voice, a voice which uh, over the years and decades, we have not been very uh, recipient to. So thank you very much. Uh, for giving them the platform, for letting the youth, youth voice come uh, forth very clearly about their ideas and also about the solutions uh, they find and they see uh, to the Sri Lankan uh, agriculture and to the Sri Lankan food system. That said, <clears throat> I would like to uh, just focus on a couple of points. The first of which is that we have to keep in mind that after declining for decades, uh, global hunger has again shown an upward graph. And over the last couple of years, we find that hunger is rising in the world. Even today, as we speak, more than 800 million people around the world are going to go to bed hungry and they're suffering from uh, chronic hunger. Beyond hunger, there are about 2 billion people in the world who are suffering from various forms of uh, malnutrition. And if we do not act promptly now, and if we do not act decisively now, my fear is that we will uh, miss the bus and do, we will not be able to deliver upon uh, sustainable development goal two, which is talking of ending hunger and achieving food security and nutrition for all. And Sri Lanka is a signatory to to these sustainable development goals. We all know uh, that climate change, conflicts, inequitable economic growth have really uh, impacted agriculture in a very negative way. Uh, the alarm bells are ringing, but sadly, the question to be asked is, are we, are we really listening to the alarm bells and are we taking the corrective action? to ensure that the food systems become more sustainable, to ensure that we grow enough food for everyone to access nutritious food, and that we are nature positive and that we are growing more from less. Let's face the truth. Uh, the youth about whom we are talking today and for whom we have gathered today, they are not really enchanted by agriculture. We may call them agents of change, but the fact remains that slowly but surely agriculture sector is becoming geriatric. And I think we really need to do something about it. 
today's youth, even from those from the farming families, do not see their future there. Every time we face this truth, every time we sit down to discuss the problem of integrating youth into agriculture, we ask this question, what should we do? And my plea is that we are asking the wrong question. Question is not what should we do? The question is what are we doing? I think we do not have time to ponder. Solutions are right there. I think it's time to act. And I'm extremely uh, happy to learn what Dr. Samar Singh had just listed out of the positive steps, positive policy decisions, actions which government of Sri Lanka has taken to ensure that Sri Lankan youth does not ditch Sri Lankan agriculture, rather comes back and integrates itself with it. Primary data across multiple countries, they confirm that youth today are not attracted to low wage, low value production. And I think what they need and what they're attracted to is modern new practices, use of technology, innovations, and definitely better returns for the time, effort, and money that they put in. Youth decision to engage in work are shaped by the environment in which they live, the economic and political context in which they live, the social norms and customs that are there, and the nature of the agri-food production system, institutions, laws, regulations, as well as parental and peer influence, media, and perhaps previous experience in life. And policymakers around the world really have to understand this and act strongly upon it to put policies in place which can pave the path for youth to really integrate themselves with country agriculture. Multiple studies have shown there is absolutely no dearth of research, there's absolutely no dearth of studies which show that access to land, access to finance, and access to skills are the key inhibitors which prevent the youth from taking to agriculture. Societies and governments around the world acknowledge this, but it is a rare government which is really putting very bold and very strong policies in place to tackle this. Steps are being taken as rightly pointed out by Dr. Simon Singh, but I think much more needs to be done. More positive and more bold actions need to be taken to ensure that today's youth comes back to agriculture. I think it is imperative for us to remember that if we want to see modern progressive agriculture, we need to bring the youth back into it gainfully. It is just the right recipe for ushering in an era of digital agriculture, of fostering technology, for bringing innovations, which can actually drive the country's agricultural growth forward. You've got to get the young people back into the game. And the picture of agriculture needs to change from the back-breaking drudgery, which is agriculture as perceived, to a modern science-based, forward-looking, challenging, innovating, and exciting proposition an exciting occupation. The brush is in our hands, we are the painters. And that picture has to be changed by us. And the quicker we do it, I think the better it will be and easier it will be for the country to really get on to the next level of agriculture. Let me end by uh, reminding or by quoting from one of my favorite uh, Bob Dylan songs, I don't know, people in my generation may have heard of it because it was written way back in 1961. Perhaps the younger people who are on the show today may not even have heard of Bob Dylan or perhaps not even have heard of the song. But the song is called The Times They Are Changing. And it goes on to say, come senators, come congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway. Don't block up the hall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time that we cleared the hallway and emptied the halls for the young to take over. We paved the pathway 
to make their integration easy. And we put policies in place to see that our agriculture goes to the next level where it is innovative, where it's digital, where it's technology driven, where it is science driven, where it is evidence driven. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharan. Um, with that, we will be moving on to our panel discussion. I would kindly like to request all those joining us to please keep your microphones muted at all times. If your connection is strong enough, you can have your video on. However, it would be really great if your microphones can be muted. Um, I would also like to remind you all to uh, kindly fill in the registration form that we have for the day. The link is in the chat. If you have any trouble accessing it, please do let me know. We'll be happy to help you out. Um, so moving on to our panel discussion, our first panelist for the day is Ms. Dakshini Pereira. She's the Assistant uh, Director at the Climate Change Secretariat. Ms. Pereira has worked extensively in climate change and related thematic areas under the Climate Change Secretariat, especially on work related to the National Adaptation Plans, development of provincial adaptation plans, and uh, the third national communication. She has worked on risk management and risk building and has a wealth of knowledge related to climate action in Sri Lanka, including stakeholder engagement in national and local processes. Uh, Ms. Dakshini, over to you. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Slyke and Trust for inviting uh, me for this important session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, I'm uh, speaking uh, on the uh, climate aspect on food systems and food security, ensuring the food security of the country. And as you all know, so, uh, Sri Lanka is a country very vulnerable to the adverse impact of climate change. Uh, and with the increasing levels of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the atmospheric temperature is increasing. So this in unbalanced conditions is changing the usual uh, rainfall patterns of the country. And this affects drastically on climate dependent sectors like agriculture, livestock, fisheries, which are the most important sectors in food security. And because of the climate change, it is predicted that there will be an increased uh, rainfall from southeast monsoon and a decrease in rainfall from uh, northeast monsoon in the future. Uh, because of that, uh, the wet zone, which is getting rainfall mainly from uh, southeast monsoon, will get more rain and will face the risk of uh, flash floods and landslides, while the dry zone of the country, which receives uh, its main rainfall from southeast monsoon, will receive less rain. Uh, uh, the important thing is most of the agricultural practices are done in the country in dry zone. So uh, with this uh, reduction of rainfall, the dry zone will face the uh, prolonged drought that will affect the agriculture. And uh, there can be changes in the rainfall pattern because of this climate change. Yeah, intensity of the rainfall can change and also shifting of the zones affecting all sectors, not only agriculture, uh, other sectors will also face difficulties. And this changing rainfall uh, pattern may also affect the cropping seasons. The, then the farmers uh, need to adjust these cropping seasons with the changes in the climate change. And they also need to consider in crop selection. Uh, because of the changes in the temperature the, and the rainfall, some crops we used to cultivate in a particular area may not be suitable uh, in the time to come. So in that case, they, uh, we either have to select varieties of the same crop, uh, which can tolerate the new condition, or we may have to shift to another suitable uh, crop uh, to suit the conditions in the ground. And uh, also these usual uh, agricultural practices, mainly very water uh, consuming practices, we have to uh, take into consideration and we need, may need to change because of the uh, water scarcity. And uh, when you consider the hazards and risk identified in uh, we, 
there will be increased flash floods, landslides, and high wind conditions can happen, uh, affecting crops and prolonged droughts uh, can occur. And also uh, with the sea level rise, uh, salt water intrusion uh, can happen, affecting uh, crops. And because of this uh, 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 climate change, heat, can be a problem. And then be, uh, because of the changing conditions, some biological agents can also affect uh, negatively to the crops. Uh, like we may observe uh, we, uh, weed spreads uh, and uh, uh, most, uh, like uh, the insect uh, growth can be increased. And with the changes of precipitation, we the crops uh, can be damaged. And also, there can be extreme weather events. Uh, we uh, may uh, observe uh, in the future. And uh, when we are speaking of the policy interventions we have taken, uh, the main thing we I want to uh, stress is uh, uh, we have prepared the uh, uh, national adaptation plan for the climate change impacts. Uh, the, uh, this uh, plan was prepared in 2016 and the implementation period of the plan is uh, 2016 to 2025. In this plan, we have identified nine vulnerable sectors uh, affected by climate change. Food security is the main one, uh, which includes agriculture, livestock, and fisheries. And under this uh, sector, we have identified main adaptation needs and also adaptation actions need to be taken. And uh, uh, in uh, as uh, you all know, climate change is a very cross-cutting sector. So the ministry alone won't be able to implement the plan. And in preparation of the plan also, we have taken the participation of all stakeholders. And in the plan itself, we have identified responsible agencies in implementing of each of the activities with KPIs and time targets. Uh, this national adaptation plan is implemented at the national level uh, 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 with all the stakeholders, but we have identified that some actions need to be taken at the sub-national level in order to build resilience. Uh, in that aspect, uh, we, the Climate Change Secretariat has initiated provincial adaptation planning and implementation. Uh, we have conducted series of workshops covering all nine provinces uh, in order to build awareness uh, on climate change and involve the provincial authorities in mainstreaming climate change into their uh, plans. And uh, in uh, implementing this national adaptation plan, we, we identified there are gaps uh, in uh, achieving the targets uh, of uh, adaptation uh, in the country, like in policy, there are policy gaps, information gaps, uh, capacity gaps, uh, and technology transfer gaps. So, uh, to in order to address all these gaps, we uh, were able to submit this proposal and secure funding uh, of Green Climate Fund to strengthen the sectoral and provincial agencies and create an enabling environment for successful implementation of the NAP. Uh, and I'm very happy to say last year we got the approval for the project and now uh, we just started implementing and with this project we will be increasing the capacity of all the sectors related to climate change and all the provincial agencies. And uh, under this project, we will be assessing the available uh, policies and legislations in climate adaptation and identify gaps and address them. And also uh, we will establish and strengthen the clim sectoral climate cells as well as the provincial climate cells. And uh, we will uh, facilitate uh, preparation of the provincial adaptation plans. Uh, and also we, are, uh, we will be uh, update in the national adaptation plan time to come. And uh, this project will also facilitate the preparation of the uh, project proposals to seek the funding, external funding uh, to the important areas of adaptation. 
and uh, we have just uh, uh, submitted our national determined contributions according to the Paris Agreement co commitments. We, uh, in our uh, NDCs, national determined contributions, we have identified agriculture, livestock, and fisheries as uh, important sectors in adaptation, and we have given our adaptation targets uh, in NDCs. Now we are in the stage of preparing the implementation plan with the stakeholders engaged. And at the ground level implementation, we already have two projects approved from the uh, Green Climate Fund. One is implementing in the uh, uh, dry zone of the country, targeting farmers in uh, water sector mainly. And also we just got approval from for a, another project uh, for the upper watershed area, also uh, focusing on the agriculture and uh, water security uh, uh, that uh, on of the uh, central highland areas when you consider the youth the main topic of the uh, today's discussion uh, i think in where in speaking in relation to the food security uh, we need to adjust to the new conditions with the climate change and systems need to be changed as mentioned by previous speakers i think technologies need to be uh, changed and also the systems need to change and uh, youth uh, involvement is very important in this aspect because they have a good a chance of uh, changing and adjusting to the new conditions. And I think it, it is very important that involvement of the youth in the sectors. And I think it, it is a good opportunity also because uh, with the climate change, anyway, we have to use the new technologies, new conditions and youth uh, is interested in. So we can, if we can attract the youth to the sector, it will be very good. For, for the climate change aspect as well. And now, uh, uh, if I'm speaking about how to engage them in uh, uh, the climate related actions, uh, the youth can be uh, uh, engaged in uh, uh, project proposal preparation and project implementation. And also they can be part of uh, provincial climate uh, cells. And also in NAP implementation, we have a CSO forum to be established. And in that uh, aspect also youth involvement can be taken. And I think youth involvement is not only should limit it to the policy, invention, policy interventions because their involvement is mainly on the actual ground implementation in the adaptation action should be on that uh, because they, they are the future of the country and uh, we have to adjust the agricultural systems uh, to the new conditions and they are, they, their help can be, if their help can be taken, that will be a huge advantage uh, for the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pereira. Um, with that, I would like to move on to our next panelist, Dr. Dharmashree Vijayaratna. Dr. Vijayaratna is the Assistant Food and Agriculture Organization representative for UNFU Sri Lanka. Before this role, Dr. Vijayaratna was the additional secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture <laughs> where he supported to improve the technicalities of the sector. Dr. Vijay Ratna. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning to everyone. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. I have a small presentation. I'll share my screen. I speak on food systems of Sri Lanka, highlighting vulnerabilities, challenges, and good practices, and also try to focus food system transformation 
through a youth lens. I'm quite sure you all know about food systems uh, summit program and uh, there are so many other initiatives about future of food systems as well as how to get involved in the youth as well as from the other sector and especially from the private sector as well. Can you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Vindira. Okay. Uh, and food systems as per Sri Lankan's context, I think we can simplify it to four main categories, the production, handling and logistics, that primary processing, secondary processing and uh, transportation, including storage, and then the trading component, and lastly, consumption. To make it things easier, we leave out uh, waste management and other components. We just take the main components for this short presentation. And just to remind, Food System Summit action tracks, there's five action tracks, safe and nutritious food, sustainable consumption, uh, nature positive production, equitable livelihoods, and build resilience. We'll see what are the challenges, especially the challenges for Sri Lankan countries, and also see how you can get involved because right now we are trying to do the transformation aiming at 2030. The first action tracks is ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all. In Sri Lanka, we know the health sector is very good, but when it comes to nutrition, it's kind of stagnated. It's not improving for the last few years. A very good indication is we have the global food security index as well as global hunger index. And for both indexes, there are something like 120 to 122 countries. And usually the developed countries are not involved in this uh, indication, but even though Sri Lanka placed in mid 60s in global food security index. I think it's 64 last year and global hunger index that is also somewhere in 65. Uh, and it's kind of stagnant for the last few years. It didn't change the main reasons for the malnutrition as well as stunting and wasting. It's there, it's not showing a positive trend. So we really have to handle this malnutrition. Malnutrition, we used to have triple burden of malnutrition, but now it's getting into, we used to have double burden, but now it's moving into triple burden as well. And then the local nutritional issues, think about the local issues. Uh, when it comes to calorie, I don't think we have a major issue because the total available caloric value for Sri Lanka per day is come into 3000 calories per day, but that is inclusive of all the losses as well as waste. So that means we have fair enough amount of calories, but what are the missing elements? Vitamin A is missing uh, younger children. Vitamin B, especially folic acid or folate is missing. Iron is missing and also the protein content. So we really have to handle these things to improve our nutritional status. How do we do that? We have to think about food-based dietary guidelines. The Ministry of Health, with the assistance of UN, especially with the FAO, came up with the new version of food-based dietary guideline. And this is mainly to give guidance for the consumers, how to plan their meal and then how to consume so that you make sure to get all the nutrients and the caloric value available for the daily need. But then the most importantly, the, the missing component here is the awareness and the uh, giving the awareness and making it a behavioral, making a behavioral change. It's a long process, but then all has to get involved. I think the youth can get really involved in this area because this has to go penetrate into the grassroots level. And then the food safety. Food safety, we are not at a very good level 
even though the legislation is there, practice is not there. And also we don't have food safety authority as well in Sri Lanka. So in practice, we really have to improve the food safety practices. It's not only the contaminants, people are very worried about the contaminants, the agricultural contaminants, but then you really have to worry about the microbial contaminants as well, not only the chemical contaminants. Go to the next slide. The action track two is sustainable consumption. I'll include production as well as consumption. So what we do is in Sri Lanka, most of us, including the government, pay a whole lot of attention about major food crop and the feed crop, that is rice and maize, and then don't pay that much of attention to other commodities. I think we have to move away from that, and we have to go for nutrition-sensitive agriculture. If Sri Lankan diet is lacking vitamin A, vitamin B, that is folate, uh, and iron, and protein, we have to make those commodities, which contains those missing elements, may, we have to make it freely available. We have to make their prices affordable for most of the people throughout the year. For that, we have to go for nutrition sensitive agriculture. When we plan, we have to plan accordingly so that we can get, consumers get, can get enough protein from their uh, food products and also enough vitamin A as well as folate acid as well as iron. One could say that all these things could be easily you can get from animal products, but then animal products are not so popular because of the price as well as socioeconomic reasons and also religious reasons. So we have to think about the other avenues. And also we don't go for planned agriculture cultivation. We don't plan accordingly as per the requirement. So we have to do a system where we cultivate so that we can get enough commodities of required agriculture produce. Otherwise we'll pay a whole lot of attention to rice and maize and other few commodities. And then what happens is some of the prices of food commodities will go up. So people will tend to eat only very few commodities. So that leads to malnutrition and scarcities of some of the vitamins, minerals, as well as uh, proteins. And then when we produce, we lose almost 30 to 40 percent of our perishables, that's fruits and vegetables, due to post harvest losses. And also the grains, the non perishables, uh, we lose something like 8 to 10 percent. 8 to 10 percent, I think we can live with that. It's fair enough uh, figure. But then 30 to 40 percent uh, loss of fruits and vegetables is kind of a loss for the total economy. So we really have to have measures. I'm not asking even at 20 in next few years, we should not go for cold chains, which is very expensive. You really need a huge capital. And also it may not suit very well to the local condition because we have small farmers. So removing field heat and other technicalities will be a little difficult. So for the time being, I think we have to go for easily usable methodologies like use of uh, plastic crates or cardboard boxes so that we can reduce the post-harvest losses. And the most recent thing is food waste. We never talked about food waste previously, but now we found out, especially in the Colombo municipality area, we throw away something like, per day, we throw away something like 300 metric tons, tons of uh, food. So that can be reused, recycled, or probably we can uh, make compost out of that rather than using it for landfilling. So we have to aim for these things and youth can get involved in these things, especially the leftover food, especially at the restaurants. I know there are a few initiatives, but there are still a lot has to be done, I think it's high time that we get involved in these activities. Boost nature, positive production. Uh, the new scenario in Sri Lanka is we don't, uh, we have a policy now not to import the inorganic fertilizer. So we have to go for natural fertilizer rather than banning of inorganic fertilizer. We'll call it eco-friendly cultivation, which we are familiar with. 
So the ban of fertilizer pesticide, the issue is uh, right now, we don't know whether the community, the farming community is ready for that or even the extension community, extension staff is ready for that. But then we will have teething problems, but then the attempt is uh, something who will, uh, we all appreciate, but uh, we are a little worried about the timeline. But of course, this is a good thing. So we have to think about those things. And also in Sri Lanka, we know our limitations are land as well as the water. So when we think about future, we have to think about future smart foods, which doesn't need that much of inputs so that we can use extra land, which doesn't have that much of uh, water availability or which is not very suitable for traditional kind of cultivation. So for that, we have to identify the uh, traditional commodities, which doesn't need that much of uh, inputs. And then we have to go on uh, promoting those systems. And also in the same time, we can think about organic systems, especially where there is a good market. If there is a good market, uh, in export market, then you can go for organic systems. I think even for the locals, the, the organic products will have a attraction. Action track four, usually we don't talk about this very much. It's the advanced equitable livelihoods. In cultivation, we have most of the farmers are small scale farmers. So at the end, the profit margins of small scale farmers are very low. So we have to make sure that the profit margins for small scale farmers are acceptable at an acceptable level. It's not that in Sri Lanka that some of the stakeholders are getting huge margins. It's the inbuilt uh, differences of the long value chains. The product the commodities change hands so many times and then there are so many players. So the shelf life get shortened and the product get rotten. We, uh, losses are very high. So everyone loses, especially the farmer at the tail end of the system and also the consumer. Both tail enders are suffering because of the losses. So we have to do something. We have to re investigate and revalidate our value chains and we have to make it shorter and we have to make sure that especially the both end user as well as the producer should get fair enough margins and the prices. And also in Sri Lanka, we don't do value addition. So we depend most of our cultivation on rainfall pattern and then we have seasons. So most of the commodities, we have gluts during the season and then lean period. So we have to go for value addition. Of course, in Sri Lanka, the energy is so expensive and the packaging materials are also expensive because we don't produce it here, but then we have to do something and then we have to change the system so that rather than throwing away the excess produce, we have to add value and increase the shelf life. And then most importantly, in the future, we really have to build resilience. We all know that uh, we, got, we get a good harvest. We got a bump crop uh, if, there are, if we get enough rains during the right period. But as the previous speaker pointed out, because of the climate change, we don't get that uh, yellow rains as well as maha rains. So the most uh, northwestern or the monsoonal rains are not very it doesn't come in the right dates. So we have to build resilience into that. It's not only saving water, but then we have to do something about how to handle the droughts as well as floods. As the previous speaker pointed out, we have to go for the right cropping system, right commodities to cultivate, and also to have the right agronomic practices. And then there are so many ways we lose crop losses. We have to handle that. Of course, the crop insurance is there, but then farmers doesn't get enough returns due to 
the existing crop insurance system. We have to have a system where if there is a prolonged drought or a flood is there, then they should get fair enough amount due to crop insurance. So we have to come up with a new system. And also to get improve the production productivity, I think we have to get the attraction of the younger generation, especially in the food value chain from cultivation to marketing. Because we really need new technologies. The new technologies coming up with the youth is not happening right now, even in the developed world, even in Japan, and the average age of a farmer is above 40. We have to take it down to 30s so that the younger generation are very familiar with the new technologies. We can include new technologies in Sri Lanka. We still, we are yet to see uh, the perennial vegetables where you can harvest uh, vegetables for throughout the year, something like 12 months or 18 months. And uh, then the inputs are limited, but of course you need capital for that. So we really have to come up with a system where the farmers or those who are interested in farming can get the initial capital easily. And I really want that sector to be open for the youth as well. And thank you very much, especially for your attention. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Vijay Ratna. Let's, let's move on to the next part of the agenda. I would like to welcome uh, our legal and research officer, Ms. Sajani Dhanasinghe, to provide an introduction um, to the report presentation. Sajani. Um, thank you, Sinashia. So Slyke and Trust works across several key thematic areas such as climate change, adaptation and resilience, mitigation, sustainable consumption and production, livelihood uh, diversification, gender, ecosystem conservation, landscape planning, community empowerment, circular economy and waste management in which food systems are a key element. Similarly, across all these thematic areas, youth are key stakeholders in our work and Slyke and Trust has recognized the potential of youth in bringing innovative solutions to transform food systems in a positive way. Slyke and Trust has taken a number of initiatives focusing on youth and food systems, such as the virtual summit on resilient and regenerative food systems in October 2020, the virtual summit on just transition in December 2020, and the fifth Global Youth Forum on Climate Change in December 2020, to name a few. To build on this work and the lead up to the United Nations Food Systems Summit, Slyke and Trust conducted a series of independent dialogues under the UN Food Systems Summit at international level, as well as national and provincial dialogues with youth in Sri Lanka. The participants of these dialogues were between the age of 18 and 35 years. The two independent national dialogues were held on the 20th and 24th of August, with youth providing inputs focused on the five action tracks of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. Similar to the dialogue, uh, the national dialogues, the provincials, provincial dialogues too focused on the five action tracks of the summit. For the provincial dialogues, Psych and Trust selected through an open process youth coordinators who would support the mobilizing of youth for each province. These youth coordinators contributed to ensuring that youth from each province were engaged through scaled up outreach activities in addition to the organic engagement through open invitations for each provincial workshop that was published. Altogether, 10 provincial dialogues were conducted covering all nine provinces of Sri Lanka. In addition to this, an online survey was conducted to gather further information from youth regarding specific areas related to youth engagement in food systems, building sustainable food systems through climate-friendly actions, and scaling up youth-led initiatives which contribute to just transition in food systems in Sri Lanka. The online survey gathered information from over 400 youth respondents, while the dialogues had a participation of over 500 youth. Further engagement with youth was conducted through social media where the discussions were promoted 
and additional communication and awareness creation activities were conducted on the activities related to the food systems dialogues. The information gathered through the dialogues has been shared with the focal point for the member state United Nations Food Systems Summit's dialogues for Sri Lanka. The key findings of these dialogues are being published as a research report by Slyken Trust, which we are launching here today. That is it from me. Now I pass the screen to my colleague, Chalani Marasinghe, to share some of the key uh, points highlighted in the report. Chalani, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sajani. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you could uh, see my screen. I can see Charani. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, so, uh, as Sajani mentioned, uh, it's like and trust uh, is launching the uh, research report on youth engagement in Sri Lanka's food systems findings from the national and provincial level. Uh, the research report is based on the national and provincial level consultations, independent food system summit dialogues, and a virtual national survey among youth aged 18 to 35. Uh, I'm Charlie Marsing, a co coordinator of Global Youth Forum on Climate Change from Slike and Trust. Uh, so, today uh, I will uh, give a brief uh, explanation about the research report and the background for the uh, research report on youth engagement in Sri Lanka's food systems. Uh, so the content uh, includes the overview of the research report and uh, issues and challenges faced by youth in Sri Lanka and proposed action based on our key findings of the uh, research report. Uh, uh, before uh, going to the key findings, I would uh, highlight some uh, uh, methodology and objectives of the uh, session. So we have conducted uh, three, uh, like uh, uh, two independent national dialogues, uh, 10 provincial dialogues and nas one national youth survey to uh, gather the information uh, for this report. And this is the, the uh, findings are uh, based on the inputs of the youth who participated in the di dialogues and surveys. Uh, that uh, we have conducted. So as you could uh, see, uh, we have done uh, a series of dialogues uh, representing all the nine provinces in Sri Lanka and two national dialogues uh, representing the country context uh, and also additional dialogues. And we have conducted a virtual survey uh, for youth in Sri Lanka uh, to find the uh, uh, find the uh, data uh, related to this uh, uh, report. Uh, uh, when we consider uh, considering about the uh, findings, uh, the findings are uh, based on the independent national uh, to independent national dialogue, uh, ten provincial dialogues, and national youth surveys. The uh, analysis has been done uh, with the data which we have collected through these uh, dialogue series. Uh, you could uh, have a more, uh, in, more uh, understanding and more uh, descript uh, descriptive uh, analysis could be found uh, in this report. So I will uh, highlight some key findings that uh, we have gained through this uh, uh, youth dialogue series uh, under the uh, four act, uh, five action tracks. Uh, first uh, action track uh, is the ensure access to safe and nutritious food for whole, uh, food for all. So under that, uh, the issues and challenges that we have identified were uh, like lack of household uh, food security. For that, proposed actions were enhancing home and community garden initiatives, promoting locally and seasonally available foods, uh, and. Uh, the second challenge, insufficient intake of nutritious food among Sri Lanka's populations. Uh, for that, proposed actions were strengthening the school feeding programs and nutrition supplement programs of pregnant and newborn children to prevent issues such as stunting and nutrient deficiencies. Uh, 
educating the public on locally available nutrient rich traditional foods and age specific food requirements. Uh, also, uh, lack of support for COVID-19 recovery, promoting foods that build the immunity system while also ensuring those who are vulnerable and affected receive the uh, right uh, goods. So I want to uh, like uh, highlight that these are a summary of the key findings that we have received from the uh, our dialogue series. I just put a kind of uh, highlighted key findings to uh, just give an overall idea. Uh, so under the action track to uh, shift to sustainable consumption patterns, uh, one of issue that we have identified these widespread unhealthy food consumption patterns and habits. For that, uh, the proposed actions uh, were altering lifestyles and attitudes towards food uh, through media campaigns, taking into account the national the nutritional and social value of food as well as food safety, promoting advocacy of uh, psychological profi uh, professionals to change food-related behaviors with positive reinforcement and make available behavioral therapy for those suffering from food addictions and compulsive eating disorders. And also you uh, identified like a limited understanding of concepts like planetary health and sustainable diets. Uh, for that uh, proposed actions were educating youth on the aspects of a planetary healthy diet, educating youth on the meaning of sustainability and nature of sustainable operations, promoting local and indigenous nature-based consumption patterns to media and school curricula. Uh, also, limited adoption of institutional policies towards sustainable food. For that, implementing policies such as school canteen policies, considering food based dietary guidelines and planetary healthy diet, establishing transparent tender systems with high standards, uh, select can canteen partners for schools, universities, and other institutions. Uh, under the action track three of boost nature positive production. Uh, issues or challenges identified as limited demand for nature positive products. Uh, proposed actions were creating awareness on health and environmental impacts of unsustainable food value chain practices to help shift towards more sustainable products, promoting nature positive products through eco labeling and certification processes. Mm. And uh, also a limited engagement of youth in food production. For that, proposed actions were promoting success stories of youth and rewarding youth for using nature positive production, integrating alternative technological studies and farming into school curricula, creating vocational training courses and informal means of education. Uh, under the action track four, advanced equitable livelihoods. Uh, the issues and challenges were identified as lack of youth engagement in agricultural livelihoods. Uh, proposed actions were offering advanced degree certifications to give social recognition to the sector, offering incentives and support to youth uh, who invest their time and labor in agricultural activities, strengthening social protection networks and safety nets to reduce risk in agricultural livelihoods. Uh, and also low economic diversification and uh, employment opportunities in many rural areas. The proposed uh, actions include uh, many food certifications, more transparent and inexpensive and enhancing awareness, collaborating with stakeholders to support the shift towards a more sustainable food system. Under the last uh, action track of action track five, build resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks and stress. Uh, the issue was uh, vulnerability of smallholder far farmers and other primary food producers to climate impacts, disasters, and other shocks. Uh, proposed actions uh, improve climate risk forecasting technology by engaging youth in developing and monitoring early warning systems. Distribution level vulnerabilities to shocks and un unexpected stresses, encouraging households to grow their own food and maintain food reserves to ensure food, se food self sufficiency, identifying food and nutritional requirements of the community to move from mass production to focus production, uh, lack of multi stakeholder engagement in food systems transformation under. Uh, proposed action developing short and long term strategies by problems and uh, local solutions to a bottom up approach, 
learning from international good practices and uh, experiences. So these are kind uh, uh, just uh, highlights of the reports, uh, which are based on the youth inputs uh, we have received from the independent national dialogues, provincial dialogues, and national youth survey. Uh, 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 after it, uh, the full report will be available on our adaptation and resilience knowledge hub, and uh, also we are. Uh, expected to uh, send it around by email for you uh, with you so i think uh, you just uh, could have a, a, a brief idea about the report and uh, the sources methodology and objectives of the report so uh, we, we, we will be uh, sending the uh, descriptive report with you you could uh, share your comments and uh, I, the, the comments on the report as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chalani and Sajani. And as Chalani mentioned, the report will be available on the website. So um, please, uh, and we will be, if you've registered with us using our registration form, we'll be sending you the report as well as the recording to this session as well. So if you haven't registered, please let us know and we'll be happy to share the link with you. Um, now I would like to hand it over to my executive director, Ms. Vasita Vijayanayaka, to uh, take over the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanasha. Um, a big thank you to all the speakers who gave very valuable inputs, um, and also Chalani um, and uh, Sajani for introducing the findings of the report that we are launching today. I have a few targeted questions for each speaker, um, the main panelists. And, and then I will also open the floor to some of the experts who I can see in the participants list. So I'm just going to tell your name. So please be prepared if you are available in the next 20 minutes to give two or three minutes input. Uh, I see Professor Marabe, I see Dr. Sugata Pala, I see Mr. Satura Singha, Dr. Sam Daniel, and also Dr. Chandra Fadmini on the list of participants. So I will open the floor to you um, once I have the targeted questions asked from the speakers. And um, then please give your inputs also on what we're discussing today. And uh, if anyone else would like to take the floor, we will open the floor to them as well uh, in a bit. Um, so first question, if I could maybe ask Dr. Gamini Samarasinghe. Um, Dr. Samarasinghe, if you can hear me. I hope you can. Um, so the first one is for you. Uh, you mentioned about youth entrepreneurship being supported through activities of the Agricultural Ministry. Um, so the first question is about this. How would uh, you get access to this um, program, whether the information is out there, whether this is something being initiated at the moment, and what is the focus on youth in this? How can they get information? That's the first question. The second one is on insurance and loan schemes you mentioned. So um, actually, those two things I picked also because we are also launching an accelerator program today uh, at midnight, which has a food systems component in it. So we'd be interested in seeing how this could um, contribute and complement the work that you're doing. Plus uh, the work on insurance, uh, climate and disaster risk insurance that we've been doing. Uh, there's the risk assessment and also um, points that we have found. So one thing that we've seen is also youth engagement in insurance processes and risk management processes have been low. How do you target this? How have you... Um, um, decided on how to get youth involved in the process more, and do you have specific areas that you target in these activities? So two questions over to you. Um, I think you're muted. Dr. Samuel Singer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, the first question that's on uh, uh, Agriculture Entrepreneurship Development. Uh, so I guess I got the question very clearly. So first one is actually the ministry, uh, the cabinet ministry, right? We had a uh, uh, very small uh, amount of funds from the treasury. So they are, we mainly uh, uh, focus on uh, actually establishment of this operation, and agriculture management information systems, uh, because you know, uh, as uh, I think even the speaker said that we have to be 
go for the digitized uh, agriculture, right? Therefore, uh, that is very impo important because we see uh, we don't have the uh, correct data, right? So based on that, we make decisions. So since so there's a big need that to have a very good agriculture information management system that we have initiated that one. Uh, and the other one is, uh, you know, this uh, we have to go for a very scientific approach like uh, testing soil, application of uh, fertilizer before, after testing the soil, the, we are given the requirement because now we are moving towards this uh, eco-friendly agriculture as well. They are, we have spent uh, that amount of money for soil kits, right? Even if you have supported that one, buying the soil kits, so that the, the, the fertilizer will be applied based on the soil test results, so that uh, we, we are moving uh, again uh, looking for the eco-friendly agriculture. In, in, uh, in addition to that, uh, as I said, there are a lot of cluster programs like uh, promotion of lime and passion fruit cultivation, beekeeping projects, vegetable cultivations, then the mushroom cultivations, and even seed production. Seed, because seed is a big issue, Especially now, you see the prices of seeds in the uh, like black, black gram and the green gram. So uh, there's a high need of uh, seed uh, for the cultivation. So that kind of support we have given, the, uh, given and also establishment of export agriculture villages that we have already uh, initiated that work. And uh, in addition to that, as I said, this uh, uh, we have this uh, World Bank funded projects like uh, uh, the agriculture modernization project through which we uh, are creating production clusters and also value chains as well. So now already now we have also visited that one uh, clusters on banana and uh, passion fruit and chili have been already initiated. Uh, the other one is the uh, the climate smart irrigated agriculture project that is actually they have identified the hotspot areas especially in Anuradhapura district uh, and they are and Mondragal as well and they are they support uh, to develop this uh, agriculture uh, that is uh, AC centers agriculture service centers for that for that uh, they look for supplying this uh, machinery hub and all so that uh, you know uh, if you provide the machineries, uh, definitely this uh, machinery hub will be managed by the, not only by this, uh, the, the government itself, the participation of the private sector as a public. So there are a lot of youth involvement will be there. Uh, in addition to that, the, we have another project called SAP project. They are from that, a lot of grants are available for the entrepreneurs to initiate their work. So those are the kind of things that uh, uh, the ministry has initiated. So I think uh, that will help to attract you as well. Would you mind if you uh, tell me the second question, please? Thank you very much for that detailed uh, answer. And the second one was about insurance and loan schemes you mentioned about resilience building in agriculture and the crop insurance yeah. is already there. Just want to know whether there are specific areas that you're focusing on or do you have a plan that is for youth um, agriculture practitioners that you have planned or how does it work? Yes, yes. As I said, this agriculture, the quite, uh, the certainty for agriculture is quite uh, low because uh, as we are facing this climate change, especially the climate change challenges, therefore insurance is a must for the uh, uh, this uh, crop production, right? Therefore, we have separate entity called Agriculture and Agrarian Agri Agri Insurance Board, they are they have already actually they are having a uh, the pension scheme, farmer pension scheme because you know this uh, it will be a definitely attraction of the people uh, if there's a pension scheme because after that uh, they can uh, spend their life without much problem. So uh, it it has been already launched now. It is approved by the cabinet, right? So AIB, so they are uh, making the process, uh, the necessary arrangement to uh, implement that plan. It's already done. Now, regarding the agriculture insurance, uh, now uh, we have only uh, 
the system free insurance for major crops like five major crops including paddy so that one the burden is uh, for the government right so so we have realized that one and uh, also from the uh, the farmers and the especially youth sector they they are the request right to have the insurance scheme for other crops as well so for example now recently we had a huge damage on uh, the papaya cultivation and banana the north right due to this cyclone so actually that has to be paid by some of disaster management uh, system because since there were no insurance right so uh, we are now preparing a uh, cabinet paper to cover all the crops right just paying a very small amount right uh, so we have to have a mechanism how these uh, people are getting to that one because as the farmers are not well aware about the benefits of the insurance scheme right so we should have a mechanism very good mechanism uh, so that we should do some kind of persuasion to engage to uh, to uh, yeah to uh, enroll in the insurance scheme right so that uh, i think that will help also the, especially for the youth to join these agricultural uh, enterprises uh, with these insurance schemes as well thank you um, dr samna singh i mean i asked a question because we have done some research at national level as well as um, district level on climate and disaster risk insurance and also risk transfer mechanisms and some of these gaps have been highlighted um, for youth as well as private public partnership to scale up the existing challenges in implementing or accessibility of compensation um so we'd we'll definitely be interested in seeing how this goes and maybe contributing to the process with a special focus on youth and women as well as a broader partnership aspect to it on how multi stakeholder driven actions could happen on insurance um being um more informed and people being more aware of the benefits of it i think uh, in the open discussion maybe someone could add a bit more on what exactly has happened in the ground Uh, at the ground level on this front um so thank you very much mr samar singh okay. for all the inputs uh, i'll move to the next speaker um mr sharan um so i hope you can hear me um so the question is how would the findings um that were highlighted about youth engagement input systems uh, benefit the work of fao um, that's ongoing and do you have any specific projects potentially that could contribute to um, um linking this you know the actions that have been identified and implementing them at the ground level mr sharan i hope you are there i, I can't see you at okay so mr sharan is not in at the moment so i'll move to dakshini ms dakshini pereira for the next question um so ms pereira you highlighted the ndcs and the nap related work that's happening uh do you see specific actions for youth in the ndcs and nap implementation that you could see now um you mentioned the forums and all um but do you see the action plans that are being developed having a youth focus that's the first question the second one is about the projects that you mentioned the the green climate fund supported ones uh, would there be a specific support that youth could receive for climate action and food systems through these projects say for example a grant process or um, them to be involved directly in implementing these actions do you see opportunities like this sir yeah yeah thank you vasita uh, my first question uh, uh, was uh, to whether there is any action specific uh, identified uh, in the ndc uh, uh, for the youth yeah yeah at the moment uh, we we have just submitted our ndc targets and now uh, we are in the process of uh, preparing the implementation plan uh, in the implementation plan uh, we will be identifying uh, actions in detail with the uh, engaged groups and responsible parties to be implemented and uh, we are hoping to uh, do a cost assessment and time frame also in, to be included uh, uh, the youth engagement uh, uh, will be identified in that at the moment we are uh, 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 hoping to include gender aspect 
to the NDC implementation, but not very tar uh, focused targeting on the youth especially, but we uh, at the levels we are considering vulnerable communities uh, in different levels so you can be part of uh, that and in the activities also we can identify but at the moment for the NDCs we are in the process of preparation of the implementation plan so the, I won't be able to highlight any specific activities uh, under that but uh, when uh, in our national adaptation plan also uh, we prepared previously we we have not identified youth as a specific target group, but we have identified as a vulnerable one of vulnerable community, but not spe very specifically. But with the NAP readiness pro project, we are now in the process of reviewing uh, the gaps and we are uh, now uh, making it very uh, gender sensitive and also uh, including other groups as well for the process. So in that process, we will be able to identify uh, groups, uh, 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 you mentioned uh, gender and youth involvement in the NAP implementation. Uh, the second question was uh, the projects that I have mentioned those two projects uh, uh, implemented with the funding of Green Climate Fund. Uh, those projects, how the youth can be engaged. In the uh, first project, uh, we are uh, implementing uh, uh, in a few years from now, uh, few years now, uh, uh, we are in the middle of the implementation period. In that, we are targeting uh, the farmer communities in the dry zone in there we are making uh, new uh, introducing new technologies uh, and uh, especially targeting the uh, community in that area so in that aspect i have seen the photographs and i have seen the videos uh, i uh, uh, i have seen many youth involvement in that uh, process and also uh, tank restoration programs are going on. Um, uh, I see community involvement uh, with the youth participation involving that project. And the next, uh, the second project I mentioned was on the Knuckles uh, watershed area. In that uh, project also, uh, it is mainly on the watershed conservation, but uh, in, in that project also we have a special uh, component for the agriculture be, uh, to make the systems more effective uh, to uh, get uh, uh, to conserve the area and also to get a good income and in that project uh, we, we are planning to have uh, more uh, uh, technology involved uh, and also new uh, cash crops to be introduced and management of the land area are uh, to be improved with the new technologies because uh, in the, in uh, we have a craft uh, world agroforestry center as one of the partners for implementing this project they have new technologies developments uh, 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 which will be introduced to our country uh, and uh, I think uh, at this moment I won't be able to say how to interact with the youth but I, I am uh, sure that youth will be very much interested in involving in the new technologies and also in uh, go forward not only for the productions and uh, as mentioned by the previous speakers uh, they there should be uh, storage transportation uh, and uh, minimizing the post harvest losses which youth can be engaged very effectively so uh, in the the, the second project also there are, will be new agricultural methodologies uh, introduced uh, which youth can also engage thank you thank you uh, Ms. Farah. i was wondering whether going forward in applications we could maybe promote a, a specific action targeting youth and also youth engagement mm -hmm in the application itself so that there's a targeted activity in the overall thematic area of what the activity um, the project would be but that there is a funding support for you to engage also as a specific objective so maybe we can see how it goes forward with the findings we have and other activities that's happening in the country uh, for the next proposals if we could connect the food systems youth as well as climate action going forward thank you very much uh, so for dr Vijay Ratna. Um, I will start with the question I had for FAO earlier. Um, so how do you see the findings of the report 
uh, being integrated into the activities of uh, FAO's uh, projects um, and other processes. And the second question is, um, you mentioned a lot of input uh, from the process, the, the food system report preparation and the food systems activities. Um, so do you see plant-based diets being promoted as a solution for addressing nutritional deficiency? Um, and do we have enough data which would say this is the area we need to target? Is it something available in the country for those who are interested in engaging and implementing activities to go and implement these in partnership with the government and other actors? Yes, Yosita. Now, first to answer the question, you should that uh, if you are representative. Yes, what we try to do is this would uh, summit the report when we collect from all the information from the other groups, including US. What we try to do is come up with the come up with the plan, and then we'll discuss it with the Ministry of Agriculture. This goes until end of December. And we are working with Minister Secretary and the other officials of Ministry of Agriculture how to uh, set these activities into their action plan, national action plan. So what we are trying to do is now we have come up with the dialogue results and we are aiming at 2030, <clears throat> but Ministry of Agriculture has come up with the new national agriculture policy for the next four years. And now we are in the process of matching the policy statements, the policy statements and the strategies with what we have find out from these policy dialogues. And when we match the strategies, what we are supposed to do is we have to develop programs and then we have to go for projects and then we'll go for activities because most of the things that we have found is not at the policy level, but at the activity level. So we are trying to impregnate all these activities into the national developmental programs. So that is our main task. And we are lucky here because this year, for the next two years, we are having a project with Ministry of Agriculture. And that project is mainly to support the government to implement the policy. It's not policy building, but just to implement the policy. So we have a vehicle also to work it out. So I think we are at a good setting so that we came up with the decisions. We went through the national phase one dialogue, the second uh, provincial, and then again with the national. And fourth one is due after the summit meeting. And thereafter, what we try to do is we'll sit with the ministry officials and try to incorporate these activities into their projects and also into their programs so that it will be implemented. And uh, this won't be a one-time activity. We'll be using this information for the next few years. Did I answer your question? Yes, the first part. The second one is, was about plant-based diets, whether it could address the nutritional deficiencies and whether you have um, data that's available uh, for targeted areas that these actions should happen, um, as in, do we have maps on this is the area that nutritional deficiency exists and which group of community is most needing this support? Um, do we have national data on these things? Yes, we have national data as well as international data. The first part I'll explain. In Sri Lanka, we can't expect our community to, to eat more meat products during the next few years. Of course, our chicken consumption has increased by 10 times during the last 10 years. But then all other meat products are not increasing at that level. So right now in Sri Lanka, if we analyze the diet and also if you see the problems, the dietary problems, the nutrition problems, the most lacking vitamins and minerals are, and also the major nutrients are vitamin A, vitamin B, that's folic acid, B9, and also uh, iron. Of course, some of other 
not so essential elements are missing, but right now we are not bothered about those like vitamin E. And those three elements, if you ask from a nutritionist, they will say the best way to supplement these three elements are from meat products. But in Sri Lanka, we are not trying to do that. Of course, uh, vitamin A is retinol. Sorry for getting into a bit of a technicality, but then <laughs> you're asking for it. Retinol. No, no, I mean, it's good to be informed. Vit I'm not yeah. promoting meat consumption. Yeah, but then climate friendly and all. Vitamin A is retinol, but then retinol can be formed in the human body. If you take carotene, carotene change into retinol by uh, in the human body. So the carotene is available in uh, green vegetables. You don't have to eat uh, orange colored. It's all there in the green vegetables. So it's not so efficient, but then efficient enough for human body to convert it to vitamin A. Folic acid is uh, meat products are the best, but then the second best is leafy vegetables. If you go for leafy vegetables, it's plenty there. So if you have at least one leafy vegetable per day, that will give you enough uh, folic acid as well as or folate into your diet. And then Iron is also best absorbable through meat products because you go, it provides uh, hemo iron. But then even if you use iron through vegetable sources and then uh, if it is not reduced, if it is in ferrospheric form, and if you use it with uh, vitamin C or citric acid that is lying, then its absorbance is a bit higher. And even if you eat a very small amount of meat product like uh, sparrows or something, then that will help to absorb all that time. So evidence-based, yes, uh, you can provide everything through plant-based products, but you have to know your science. So that's why we are promoting food-based dietary guidelines. In Sri Lanka, we have come up with the new food-based dietary guideline. Most importantly, I think we have to be, we have to do a lot of work on this, promoting the uh, messages. We have developed something like 16 messages, 20 altogether with specific age groups. In these messages, we say how to consume so that uh, you won't get nutritional deficiencies. I think the first one is to eat, uh, add color into your food to eat food which has different, different colors so that you get all the antioxidants and all micronutrients from that. And also to eat uh, three vegetables and two fruits per day. So those messages carry the most important uh, elements in the dietary process. But then it's a responsibility of all of us. We can't give it only to Ministry of Health or Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Education. It has to be in the system. I know it's a difficult process because first it's the information, the awareness building, and then you have to change the behavior. You have to expect a behavioral change. And also we are having other activities like for Sri Lanka. Now we are promoting home gardens specifically for the nutritional vulnerable communities, specifically aiming at pregnant and lactating mothers and the elderly group. We can handle that, but then we have to have a focus because all this time we paid a whole lot of attention for home gardens, but that focus is mainly to economic benefits, not for nutritional benefits. So we have to change the focus. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Vijayaratna. It's very interesting. I asked that question. My follow-up question was about communication and how this could go to a bright, um, wider audience through effective communication. So I'll, before I go to the experts uh, who are in the participants list, if I could just quickly pass the mic back to Dr. Samura Singh um, on the nutritional um, aspects that uh, Dr. Vijayaratna mentioned and how maybe the entrepreneurship uh, project that's existing in the ministry plus communication and awareness plans that are happening. Um, could we have an interlink of how youth could engage and play a role in these activities? Uh, is there an opportunity for us to engage with youth and then maybe spread the message on the dietary guidelines um, or potentially linking the home gardens to entrepreneurship and then having a market for those activities as well? Yeah. Uh... Regarding this uh, nutritional aspects, actually the ministry uh, is involved in uh, home garden project because we know 
this uh, home gardens are the best way of uh, enhancing the nutrition among families and also introducing the dietary diversity, especially introduce this uh, underutilized species like uh, fruits and also especially leaf vegetables. So ministry is now a ministry with the uh, uh, department of Samodde. There we have a program now uh, to uh, issue the seeds of uh, for about 2 million, nearly 2 million uh, households, right? And uh, uh, as Dr. Vijayaratna said, actually, uh, so one thing is now uh, the protein, protein uh, deficiency. Uh, now, uh, to promote the plant-based protein sources, right? Uh, the, under the Saubhagya program, Ministry had uh, this uh, promotion of cultivation of cowpea, uh, green gram, and black gram as well. Uh, however, still we were not able to meet the requirements because now, since we are not importing, you can uh, see the prices. Now, green gram has gone up for like 800 rupees per kilo. So, that is necessary because uh, to uh, enhance the protein intake, of this plant-based protein intake. So definitely we have to promote and uh, uh, bring the prices down of this, uh, especially these uh, grain legumes. Uh, as you know, now the main sources are red dal and the, uh, the, 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 they are around 200 to 300 rupees and uh, the uh, chickpea, right? It's all I import. So we need to have, we need to promote the local cultivation of these grain legumes. In addition to that, there are some underutilized species like uh, horse gram as well. So that is, uh, we, need, uh, we need to promote because even though we have started the work, still we were not able to meet the requirements. Therefore, uh, with regard to the nutrition point of view, I think uh, uh, other than that, uh, frankly, we haven't, uh, we don't have a very uh, good programs for the nutrition. So I think in time to come, Right, definitely, we should invest on these programs, uh, especially regarding nutrition, because uh, even I have engaged in the this biodiversity food and nutrition project funded by the GIF. There we try to make awareness and uh, we analyze the this uh, local food, uh, local, uh, I mean, uh, local varieties and all. So that kind of thing, I think, uh, we need to promote, especially to make the information. To make the information on these crops. Because, you know, if you take Sri Lanka, we have hundreds of foods, we have hundreds of vegetables, even leaf vegetables are like very hundreds of leaf vegetables, so quite a lot. But the thing is, we find market very few, very few crops, uh, very few species there. So that is, I think, we have to think about to promote more, to make more effort on giving the, uh, the, showing the nutritional uh, value of those uh, species, right? And incorporate them into the diet so that we can increase the dietary diversity. In other addition is, now you know this Helabojun concept is very well established. They are also, uh, we can incorporate this, uh, this uh, underutilized uh, species into the recipes. Now already it's been done, but we need to mainstream a lot of things uh, into that. I think through that, we can promote these uh, nutrition uh, aspects uh, in future. Thank you. And Dr. Samar Singh, if say youth were interested in starting um, an entrepreneurship or an initiative uh, to promote these underutilized um, these, uh, the grains and all, would there be like schemes that could fund them at the moment or is this something that could be developed potentially as a project? So, pardon, I, I couldn't get the last uh, words yeah. you said. Is, is there any scheme that could support these activities if youth were interested in um, having agricultural practices focused on these uh, um, the items that you mentioned, say chickpeas or green gram and all? If someone would like to invest and do activities, would there be some incentives that the ministry or the state? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, ministry give this, uh, for example, now uh, green gram. 25% uh, subsidy for the seed, right? Uh, so because uh, 
as it is uh, price is very high 25% of the subsidy is given for the green gram and most of the seeds and also in addition to that uh, as they are self pollinated crops you can maintain the seed by the farmers right uh, for that ministry is giving storage facilities like uh, the ministry is providing bins like think uh, air tight containers so that they can keep the, uh, the they can sell the product and also keep the seed requirement uh, at household level and they, they can make use of them in the next time as well. So, because uh, you know, uh, uh, the seed requirement is a uh, supply of the seeds for the demand is always a problem. So, the seed production by the farm farmer itself themselves, right, uh, with the support of these agriculture extension people, is a must. So that uh, I think we can solve, uh, we can minimize the uh, the problems that uh, come uh, comes. Uh, because of the seed requirement, right? Thank you, Dr. Samarasinghe. That was very interesting. Um, we do have some projects we do with the Global Youth Forum, targeting home gardens and uh, supporting youth in activities related to food systems. This is very interesting and important information for those who might be interested in doing a project on agriculture and food systems. So we'll take it forward uh, in sharing the information with others as well. Um, so moving, moving to the next um, part of it, I do see, certain um, experts, I mentioned the names of still on the call. Thank you very much. Could I ask a few of you to give your insights on what we just discussed? Dr. Sugatapala, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, uh, very quickly, because I think we have limited time. Um, yeah, I want to touch up on one of the specific area, like we are talking about here, uh, the youth engagement in, uh, you know, food system. So, now for that type of engagement, you need uh, a skill set for the for the uh, proper engagement. And we look at the present situation, uh, the, all the sectors we talk about, the challenges we face are complex. Uh, and and uh, therefore the type of skill set we uh, expect uh, from uh, youth are different now. Uh, especially when we look at, uh, in fact, the COVID, for example, now it came as a, a public health emergency now it has evolved to an economic and social crisis. So that's the type of, uh, you know, it's not a new thing. This, these are basically addressing sustainable open goals, uh, which basically, uh, you know, touch upon this, you know, complexity. So we need different type of skills. Now, when you look at the present uh, context for the next five to 10 years, what uh, the key uh, uh, you know, skills I invite for you uh, include, uh, number one is basically we talk about analytical thinking and innovation. So innovation comes there. Even the entrepreneurship we talk about there is the number one skill we need. That doesn't mean everyone has to do the businesses, but we need the entrepreneurship as a life skill. It's a thinking, you know, the way we think. Innovation is the same thing. We don't need everyone in innovators, but we need innovation thinking to come up with solution for the present challenges. The number two is basically active learning. We should know how to learn and also then it go beyond the learning. It's also uh, need a skill to apply the learning. Then also we talk about what is complex uh, problem solving skills and so on. So, so in that context, we need the transformational changes in our education system, the way we learn. I'm not talking about only the formal education, of course, it's important, but then also we have informal and non-formal education. When you look at the most of the uh, you know, competencies uh, we develop are not through uh, formal education. It comes through informal and non-formal education. We look at even for uh, very, you know, uh, you know, uh, experts. Even uh, the, the the learning come through, uh, you know, not the formal education. So, but of course, formal education is important. And we had to look at those how to uh, we can integrate the formal, uh, informal, and non-formal education to uh, the uh, the you know the formal education and then uh, build the capacities. So basically, uh, the the we look at Sri Lankan context. Uh, this is one of the key. Uh, deficiency we talk about in learning. Uh, usually our youth, uh, they know how to learn. We call learning to know. We are very good at passing exams and so on. You know, then that is, uh, you know, it's not what we need. We need uh, to apply this knowledge. So we have to have the competency, what you call learning to do. We should, uh, should know how to do. And also finally, we also have to have a skill on learning to be. I mean that Sometimes we know what to do, but we are not part of the solution. We are not doing it. 
we tell others to do we talk a lot but we don't do it right? we are not part of the solution so therefore in the in the in youth uh, in general uh, but uh, uh, like in general when you look at even the whole society we have that gap we don't have knowledge cycle knowledge management cycle in sri lanka so that's why we have a lot of issues because uh, we don't apply our knowledge so so basically i am you know highlighting here the importance of youth uh, to develop their skill set uh, no it's a life skill we are talking about through the education at, uh, not only formal informal non formal education so that we can face these challenges so so this knowledge cycle is very important aspect uh, basically we have to generate the knowledge then create the knowledge then we have to share the knowledge and finally we have to apply the knowledge that's what we call it cycle that will uh, resolve most of the problem we are facing today so i would uh, probably stop here so highlighting the you know especially the uh, the competence requirement for youth for proper engagement thank you thank you very much dr sagarpal i know you worked with the mortua accelerator or the center for innovation i forget the exact title and um, and we are also starting this accelerator from today onwards we are launching the open call for those who would be interested in working on food systems as well as tourism and other sectors for climate and sustainable um, entrepreneurship so uh, thank you very much for those insights very interesting and it's always a pleasure to have you on the course uh, as well as working with you um mr satru singh if you can hear me and would like to add um your insights um i can see you on the list but if not we can quickly go to another expert uh, who would like to give inputs as well okay um Tamita, if you're on the call, would you like to add uh, a few inputs about the work that we're doing on the things that we just mentioned on the insurance work as well as uh, the home garden work with uh, which we potentially would be doing with SCAM going forward? Yeah, uh, basically, like you know, start with the starting with the insurance work that we are doing. We are at the ground level. We are working in the Anuradhapur and Trincomalee districts. uh closely working uh, you know getting information from the farmers how the climate change has impacted their cultivation processes uh focusing on youth what we have you know studied there is you know how interested are the youth in getting into agriculture what are the difficulties that they are facing and you know uh, one thing interesting we found out from that is like, you know they had some solutions we found out a young graduate who's engaged in sort of export uh, it was very surprising to see in an area like uh, uh, that was horopatana uh, uh, involved in export related agriculture and undergraduate from the area so like that we found out some you know uh, solutions coming through the community itself uh, in addressing these issues uh so that is something that i think we can like as you mentioned also that like this through this accelerator programs that we can you know uh, for take up and also support many more to get involved in this process as dr sudhapal said supporting them on how to be what they learn uh, and with this camp project uh, again in this uh, same areas kolonar were and radhapur and trincomalee what we are trying to do is uh also linking what mr garvin is about and said like you know this export uh, villages we are trying to identify uh, together with the, the uh, divisional secretariats you know, what are the best uh, agriculture department has you know recommended the type of uh, crops that should be cultivated linking that with the the natural resources available uh, how to also tackle with the you know uh, the other issues for example the wildlife threats and all that to balance with the existing landscape and how youth could come up with ideas on uh, you know uh, developing livelihoods in these areas so those are some key uh, activities that we actually uh, currently doing and also planning to do in the future um thank you damita i'll um allow the speakers who are willing to engage the speakers i mentioned to come in until then um i'd like to ask senasha to share the screen share the screen on something we are having today in the evening linking knowledge as well as innovation so we have a final session ahead of the summit uh, which is on building regenerative and resilient food systems with two global experts one um, professor ratan lal who is the world food prize winner for 2020 he focuses on regenerative soil systems and then the other who is mr james l ahlik i forget how to pronounce it exactly but so he is um the resident um uh in um 
entrepreneur at uh, the Stanford University. And he's also the founder of Region Villages, which has a key focus on self-sustained food systems uh, through a village system that is, uh, that is being promoted as an innovative um, application uh, across the world at the moment. So if you're interested in joining us for this, uh, it's happening at six o'clock today, and um, it has an element of entrepreneurship as well as knowledge sharing and sharing the expertise of those who have done a lot of work. Uh, on the ground as well as academically. So if you're interested, do join us. It's a 55 minute session happening from 6 p.m. to 6.55 today. Um, Senasha, maybe we can um, share the, um, um, the link and I'm sorry, James, for pronouncing your surname wrong if I did. Um, so now I pass the screen back to Senasha to take the questions from the audience uh, while allowing other experts who would like to join in and give inputs as well. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Vasita. And uh, we do have an input from uh, Professor Buddhimarambe on the chat. I would like to uh, read that out. Uh, so Professor Marambe said that um, my kind request from the youth is that in your decision making, please do not place heart before the brains and do not romanticize your actions, especially in climate actions. We have learned uh, lots of bad lessons owing to this line of thinking in the fields of agriculture, climate change, food security, etc. Critical analysis of the situation based on scientific facts will help making your engagement. Uh, thank you, Professor Marambi, for sharing uh, those insights. We do also have some uh, questions in the chat um, that I would like to read out. We have a question from Ms. Lakshman Bandarnaika. Um, it's quite a long question, Mr. Bandarnaika. If you are able to, would you like to unmute and maybe ask uh, the question or would you prefer to read it, uh, to, for it to be read out? Um, I certainly, I can, I, I can uh, summarize it. Uh, we are an organization we would like uh, you know, youth to get involved more and more in agriculture. Uh, so we are promoting uh, a scientific and regenerative evidence-based agricultural practices. And uh, we want to help, uh, uh, we want to create a new generation of agriculture uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the problem we are facing right now is this, uh, suddenly the government changed the policies. Uh, uh, we all know what the policy change is, and that has caused a lot of doubts among uh, farming community about the future viability of uh, agriculture in Sri Lanka. And uh, youth who, there was a last few years, we saw there's a kind of a trend that certain type of youth are getting involved in high value agriculture. I think uh, uh, Dr. Vijayarasa mentioned about this, if I'm right, that they, they, they like to get involved in high value agriculture. But right now, that is somewhat disturbed because of this uncertainty. So my question to FAO and the Department of Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture is, okay, while we are helping farmers to enhance the productivity of um, organic agriculture or non-chemical non agriculture, uh, we also want to see, uh, we, want also, we are also seeking help from uh, organizations like the of Agriculture and even you know people like Professor Budimarabe and FAO, uh, do you see the plans you have formulated, uh, which I believe uh, with the assumption that chemical farming will continue in Sri Lanka? Uh, will are these plans still relevant uh, to reach? The desired outcome, and if not so, uh, do you recommend prescribe any kind of remedial, uh, corrective, or mitigating action so people like us who are working on ground with farmers uh, can factor those things uh, uh, in our action? Uh, so it's a long question. I'm sorry if I got to you very very briefly. What I say is, uh, let me let me go to this. Say, um, you have created certain strategies. With Expecting certain uh, outcomes, are those strategies and expected outcomes still valid in the sudden change in the government policy? Uh, if, if not, okay, do you have any kind of, are you addressing 
uh, you know, any any possible problems in food system, inefficiencies, food system disruptions, and as a result, food security disruptions. Uh, so we can factor that in when we are talking to youth in encouraging their, encouraging them to integrate, uh, get involved with agriculture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bandar Naika. Unfortunately, we do not have any of the FAO representatives with us. However, Dr. Gamini Samarasingha is with us. Uh, Dr. Samarasingha, are you able to hear me and take that question? Uh, can you uh, elaborate the question? Because I, I couldn't hear the voice very clearly. Of, uh, yeah. Would you, would you uh, able to uh, uh, tell me the question again? It was not very clear for me. Okay. Uh, there are the voice few... was not clear. That is, that is the problem. Right. There are a few components in that question. Sorry, Mr. Ba uh, Bandar Naika, if you are able to maybe just repeat the, just the question. Maybe let yeah. me just summarize the question. Uh, um, yeah, since, uh, uh, why don't you to read it out to uh, uh, Dr. Samarasena? So. Or, uh, or uh, why don't you go to the next question? Uh, I will post that uh, question to Dr. Samarasina on the chat. So no, I think you can move to the next question. Yeah, Mr. Bandaranaik, I think I can just ask the key part that you mentioned. It was more about the strategy. This is Dr. Samarasinghe, it's more about the strategies that have been introduced in terms of organic agriculture as well as other aspects, how these would impact the those who are interested in engaging in agriculture, whether the potential for having food sustainability uh, focused, uh, uh, food sustainability satisfied uh, with the uh, strategies that are being introduced was the gist of the question, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so oh, yeah. could... Okay, uh, Dr. Savarachita, can you hear me now? Yes, can. Okay, uh, so basically we are an organization, uh, we are promoting, uh, uh, you know, scientific uh, regenerative agriculture practices among the youth. We want them to get them to you know get more involved more and more in agriculture, uh, but the sudden change in government policy has caused many uncertainties about uh, and doubts about the future viability of agriculture uh, or rather non-chemical farming agriculture. So this is causing a problem uh, in uh, you know a youth uh, that has created doubts in youth mind. So my question is okay uh, while we are uh, helping them to understand how to enhance uh, productivity of non-chemical agriculture. Uh, are there, uh, if you take the Ministry of Agriculture strategies in bringing in youth to agriculture, uh, do you use uh, uh, the, the, the strategies and the plans you have already formulated, are they still relevant? Or are they, are you modifying these plans uh, to suit the new uh, policy uh, regime? And if so, uh, do you have any kind of, you know, you know, policy, okay, so any kind of corrective measures, mitigation action you have identified, so we can take that to those things to youth when we are talking to them. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I understood the problem. Uh, the question, uh, I think you can hear me, right? We can hear you, Dr. Samson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, it's, it's, I think it's too early to give a uh, good answer for that. However, uh, now uh, the government policy actually, uh, the food security is a must, right? So it is stated in the, uh, even the uh, president's Saubhagya that more also. So uh, the other thing is, uh, I think everybody we know, that we have been going in a wrong direction, applying more fertilizer, applying more chemicals. Sometimes I think you might have chemicals. Uh, sometimes we feel that what to eat vegetables, right? So definitely we have to go for a uh, very judicious use of fertilizer and also the uh, use of these uh, chemicals, right? Therefore, we think that the, the we have the policy has been uh, uh, the taken the policy directive has been given to us uh, so we see uh, there are problems actually there are some uh, issues are there uh, however 
so we, we when we travel around the country we see there is a very good movement right for uh, the organic uh, and uh, eco friendly agriculture i would use the word eco friendly agriculture uh, therefore very good move to uh, in terms of uh, production of uh, compost and production of uh, the liquid fertilizer as right? and uh, then uh, the uh, the the uh, in addition to that uh, uh, the work on the research areas like and developing these institutes uh, structure suitable for this kind of agriculture therefore uh, it will definitely take little bit of time for the transition and also from the ministry side it, we are mainly uh, care about the food security so uh, for example now uh, uh, for the uh, this uh, what we call this protected agriculture the requirement for the protected agriculture and also this uh, floriculture industry and all so uh, the ministry has uh, i think uh, uh, listened to their grievances and uh, some remedies are going to be done with that right therefore uh, uh, so what is important is the food security and uh, the some issues will be actually we are considering these issues in order to make the uh, in order to make sure that youths are uh, youths are kept in youths are retaining the uh, this uh, agricultural systems and uh, so that is actually taken into consideration but i would uh, as i said it's uh, rather early to give a very complete answer for that i hope i answer your question thank you very much i uh, so no you did not ask my question that is fine because i don't think uh, my question is not about the government policy my question is about what can we tell our youth right now okay so it's okay yeah, sir uh, is, uh, i let yeah, me yeah, yeah, that's fine yeah i mean i i i was not questioning the policy per se because uh, you also need not justify the policy because we all know that okay now the question is okay we are having on ground problem with youth okay who we have been talking to them they want to get into agriculture right now there's a huge uncertainty okay there's a doubt we can look yeah. at the number of you know compost making etc and see hey, things are going to be great if that is so that is fine but let's let's i don't want to take time on this sir Mr. I think, Bandar Naika, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Bandar Naika, and and thank you very much, Mr. Samar Singh. Actually, as a follow up to the question, I would like to open up the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Samar Singh, for your input. I would like to actually open up the floor to our youth participants who have joined us today. Um, if you have any any thoughts or on maybe how food systems could be more resilient and how youth can maybe more be more involved in the process. and um while well, thanking uh, mr bandar naik and dr samra singh for their inputs i would like to use the last few minutes of this dialogue to see how we could uh, bring in more youth voices into this session uh, maybe to start i would like to uh, bring it back to our uh, our youth team here at like and trust uh, perhaps if uh, maybe sajani or chalani would like to start off this last few minutes of the dialogue by sharing any opening any thoughts so uh, thank you uh, so as a uh, a closing remarks for the event or uh, like just uh, to this want to say like uh, as uh, slack and trust we are uh, doing the project of beatless monday sri lanka if you could follow uh, on social media also here we are promoting uh the plant based uh, diet and we encourage plants based the uh, plant based diet uh, as a climate friendly uh, food solution so this meatless monday sri lanka uh, draws on a successful uh, campaign on uh, reducing meat consumption and raise awareness on health environment and overall benefits of uh, plant based diets uh the campaign is organized in collaboration with uh, human society international uh, is one of the key organization working on uh this area and uh, also it uh, the project aimed at advocacy and creating awareness on the need to shift towards plant based diets and to address issues uh, 
related to the planetary health and uh, adverse impacts on climate change. Uh, so uh, I want to highlight that also uh, as a, a project component, uh, a meatless Monday uh, Sri Lanka to uh, the uh, this event series also focusing on the food uh, uh, food uh, as well. Um, if uh, Sachani uh, could uh, take the floor, I will uh, uh, continue the uh, discussion more. Thank you very much, Chalani Sajani. Uh, yes, Sanashia. So I'll just give like a quick sort of a general remark. Um, it's something that I personally believe is that as youth, we have to um, lead by example. And when it comes to food systems, I think the best way that you can um, contribute to sort of a sustainable and climate friendly food system is by taking like the small step um, of uh, changing our consumption patterns um, and contributing to the larger picture. So I think it's that tiny step that as youth we need to take. Um, and maybe if we do have the opportunities uh, to sort of engage in a far more better way, uh, we should uh, take um, all those opportunities as much as we can and contribute to a sustainable climate friendly um, food system. Uh, so um, that's a general remark that I would like to give um, over to you. Sarah. Thanks, Sajani, and thank you, Chalani. Okay, so I suppose uh, with that, I uh, would like to maybe uh, remind you all once again on the uh, session that we have this evening on uh, building re regenerative and resilient food systems that will be at 6 p.m. Uh, Sri Lankan time today. I will drop a link to this on the chat. Um, please do join us if you uh, can, as well as um, um, apart from... Uh, that uh, the, the, the accelerator program that was spoken of earlier, registrations for that will be open from midnight today. And we also have one more uh, message uh, in the chat uh, from Chatra who said that I believe plant-based meat technology can reduce, um, reduce, I believe, emission levels and with, also with technology, we could move forward. So thank you very much as well. So, so thank you very much to everyone who joined and who gave us your time today. We hope to see you again at 6 p.m. And uh, until then, goodbye from us.